Very nice having you here. Have a nice one. Boa noite. Oh. Thank you. That's all my um, Portuguese tonight, unfortunately. Um, first of all, I want to say what an amazing honor and privilege it is to be part of the program tonight and part of the uh, conference this week. I'm really looking forward to all the speakers. And, and uh, I also wanted just to take a moment to thank the organizers for IXCA South America. I think the preparation has been really amazing. And, uh, and thank you so much for uh, including me. Uh, this is an expression that is not often used in English, but it is occasionally used. Um, an elephant is a horse designed by committee. Has anyone ever heard that expression before? An elephant is a horse designed by committee. Well, I'm actually here to take issue with this expression because it seems to suggest that anything designed by committee is somehow less, that a horse as a design result is somewhat better than an elephant would be as a design result. And I kind of take issue with all of that. I actually think that uh, the work that, design, that groups of designers do is really exciting. And in the, at the risk of really distorting this metaphor and, and, t and really abusing it too much, it really made me think about how I think about the world of designers. And it struck me that the world of designers for me actually breaks down into two distinct types of designers. You've got your horse designers on one side and you've got your elephant designers on another side. And when you look at it, Horse designers are kind of everything you always thought you wanted to be when you went off to design school. It's everything you thought you were going to be. They're beautiful. Look how, how lovely this horse is. They, they prance around. They're very individualistic. They know exactly where they're going. They're really works of art all by themselves. While elephants on the other side seem to look too ponderous, too large. Uh, they, they take too much time to get wherever they're going. Um, and so these are the ways that, that people think about it. But when I think about an elephant designer, I think about the people that love to work with others. So horse designers are strong individualists. They have independent spirits. They have probably very strong, elegant expression, all the things we wanted. But they're also probably a little bit temperamental. They're probably a little bit skittish. If you, if you spook them, they'll, they'll run away all in the wrong direction. Where uh, an elephant designer I think has a, a very empathetic and loyal soul. They're always focused on the herd, and they have many, many different skills. They can do many, many different things. The one problem with uh, elephant designers, you might be able to say, is that they're a little deliberate and analytical when they, as they approach their design. Well, I'm here to say tonight that I am unapologetically an elephant designer. I don't know if anybody else identifies themselves as an elephant designer, but I'm very much someone who thrives when I have a chance to work with other designers or people who aren't even designers. I love to be part of a community of people looking at design challenges. The more the people working on something, the better for me. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about designing with elephants. How do you create a really creative, collaborative herd? And I think this is really important for all of, of course, all of the elephant designers in the room. I hope there are a few out there who consider themselves people who love to work um, in teams of designers. But it's also pretty important for all of you who consider yourself horse designers, those strong individuals who know their passion around design and can execute all by themselves. Because eventually, you as a horse designer are going to find yourselves in some time working with other designers and working with clients or working in situations in which your expertise require the help of others uh, to resolve a design challenge. So this is kind of meant for all of us. Uh, my name is Brian Rink, and I work at a company in Silicon Valley called IDEO. Um, and we have gotten our start thinking about design and engineering. So when we first got started as a company, there were almost as many engineers in our company as there were designers. 
And one of the, the great things about IDEO was that the things that we could think about in the future, the, 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 the products, the services, all of those things that we could envision, we could actually build in our own shops. We, could, we had the mechanical and electrical engineering skills to build. Over time, we started thinking about design thinking as a broader set of design skills that we could apply to many, many different challenges that were kind of around form, but also about many, many other kinds of, uh, of business challenges. So we started adding on different kinds of skills, among them human factors, interaction design, which is actually one of the most highly demanded skills that we have at IDEO right now. We started adding uh, in architects to help us with space design, manufacturing liaison. Um, we actually have a group of business school graduates at IDEO now that we call business designers. And they help inspire the design process by thinking about new business models. The creative herd that I spend most of my time with is under the category of organization design. And we spend our time thinking about how we can make the organizations that we work with more creative and more collaborative, better design thinkers than they are today. So we do this in many, many different kinds of settings. We have had a lot of success working in healthcare organizations, thinking about how we can bring the skills and tools that designers and engineers use into the healthcare setting, uh, particularly around frontline delivery people, people who deliver healthcare on a routine basis, like nurses and nurse practitioners and doctors. So one of the things we did um, with a large hospital network in uh, California was to transform the, the nursing staff into designers so that they looked at their work and all of the opportunities uh, for providing newer and better services to their, to their patients as designers. We've also thought about design, bringing design thinking into uh, financial service organizations. This is a photograph from uh, a project that we did in the Czech Republic for GE Money Bank. And Apparently, I didn't know this, but apparently in che the Czech Republic, there's a lot of distrust for formal institutions re regarding money. So people are a little bit reluctant uh, to engage or to share a lot of their uh, financial information with bankers. And GE Money Bank wanted to create an organization or a style of banking that broke all the, ru the rules that everybody understood to be banking in the Czech Republic and to create a more intimate, more, store, more of a storefront um, set setting for their branch banking. More importantly, they realized that to, to deliver that new service, they had to change the organization that they built to deliver it. They had to create new roles. Um, they had to behave a little bit more like designers as they prototyped the future of their bank. We've also done um, a lot of work trying to bring design thinking into the world of government services. Um, this is a really, really interesting world. You'd think that the government would have every reason to behave as user-centered designers that really, really want to focus on citizen services. Uh, but it's actually quite hard to bring this kind of design thinking into the government world. This is some work that we did for the Transportation Security Administration in the United States. They are the people that run the security checkpoints at all of the US, uh, United States airports. You've probably had, if you've been to the US, you've probably had a less than satisfactory experience going through those checkpoints. This is a prototype that we created to transform that, proto that um, checkpoint and to provide a little bit more information, a little bit of an easier access. I have to report that a lot of the innovations that we created for this were not implemented by the Transportation uh, Safety, uh, Security Administration for a lot of reasons. Um, but the one part of our work that did prove to be transformative for them was not the product and not the services that we delivered, but it was the work that we did to help retrain all of the uh, people who provide the security at airports. And we help them think about their role differently and to behave as a much, much more of a creative team around the process of providing security at airports. 
So we provide lots and lots of, of, of services at IDEO when we think about the organization and how we can start to, in small ways and maybe even in big ways, start to transform those organizations into being um, more creative and more collaborative. We do workshops simply to build awareness around what are the principles of design thinking. Sometimes we do projects side by side with internal teams. We call them learn by doing projects in which the process we go through is something that we put our clients through and we resolve a uh, specific product or service innovation challenges they have. And sometimes we even work at the, at the bigger end of the spectrum in which we're developing an entirely new innovation strategy for our client organization. Before we go any further, I thought we'd, I'd just start with a little bit of a starter definition of what I mean by a creative herd or a kind of a robust collaborative community. Um, first of all, one of the, the basics, one of the basic building blocks for a creative community is to have people in it, a part of it who have a diversity of inputs and skills. We think it's really, really important that we don't have everybody in a room who think alike, who all went to the same school, who all have the same background, who all come from the same country even. So we think having that diversity of inputs and skills, points of view, outlook, is really essential. While we want to have that diversity, we want to anchor that creative team and that creative community with a common set of values about the work that they are doing, about what they hope to accomplish and the means by which they want to accomplish it. So building some framework that holds them together with a common set of values is absolutely essential. You really can't get started without that. And then finally, this seems obvious, but finally, this last one is very, very important. You have to have an aspiration to make new stuff. You have to want to bring new things into the world, or you're not really going to have a creative community in the way that IDEO wants to develop them. Why is this important? Because it's really, really easy and it's really tempting to talk about change a lot. Governments do this all the time. But to actually take action and to move, even in small ways, to prototype your way into a different state is a really, really different mindset. It makes you make decisions in a different way. And unless everybody on the team agrees that making new stuff is an important value, then you're really, really hard to move, move forward. So why is this important to interaction designers? Why did I bring this subject to you tonight? Well, first off, I think that interaction designers are an amazing profession. I am not myself an interaction designer, and I think because I'm not, I have amazing respect for the skills and talents that interaction designers have. I think that interaction designers and the associated professions and, and new design fields of user experience design and service design, these all feel to me like the most deeply integrated and integrative design disciplines um, that we have today. These are the ones that are at the vanguard of changing the way we think, the world, the way the world thinks about design. And as, that, as being that focus and being able to use many, many different skills and to bring many of, many of those skills into the work you do as interaction designers, it's quite likely that in the future, you are going to be the hub of many, many uh, creative herds or many, many creative communities. You are going to be people that organize them. You are going to be people who are central to setting up um, the behaviors and rules um, by which they operate. And you are going to be the people that really ensure that they are successful because you understand some, many of the other design disciplines that are represented here. Another reason I think that this is so important to interaction designers and frankly to any kind of designer is that when you work in teams and when you approach problems with experts um, inside the design field and outside the design field, you are much, much, much more likely to have those really hard, gnarly design challenges that are bigger than anything you ever, ever imagined. At IDEO, the design challenges that we are focused on today have really, really gotten large and systemic. And for us, that is really, really powerful. And we think that the, that is basically partly because we do work in such powerful teams. So tonight, I wanted to present to you 
kind of three simple case studies to talk about three very creative, highly collaborative communities that I think we can learn a little bit from um, that have a lot of interesting attributes to them. I'm going to talk a little bit about the organization I come from, which is IDEO. Then I'm going to speak about an event that happens once a year in the desert of Nevada in the United States called Burning Man. Has anyone been to Burning Man in the audience? Okay, could talk about that. And then the third example is a extended networked um, creative community that is primarily based online, but also has a some, um, some in-person and some real um, brick and mortar kind of, of attributes called Hack Forward, um, which is a startup um, that we helped to develop. So I'm gonna talk about all three tonight. But the first example is IDEO. So IDEO is a creative agency. It's, we've, we're an industrial design, product development, innovation company, um, and we've been around for quite a long time. And as I mentioned, we have this interesting mix between uh, design and technology and design and engineering. Um, now, we're not 50-50 anymore. Um, we're probably many, many more designers. But we still have a culture in which um, multidisciplinary um, teams are highly, highly desirable. So in any particular group, we'll have people who have backgrounds in business design. We'll have people who have backgrounds um, in uh, food sciences, or, or people who are specialized in development of toys. Does that mean that those people only work on those kinds of projects? No, but it's the point of view and the kind of skill set that they bring to projects. So having this multidisciplinary background is really important at IDEO. We also have a culture that is grounded in kind of, um, among other things, two very, very strong values. One is around deep empathy for end users and customers, our clients' customers. So we spend a lot of time doing ethnographic style research um, in the field and really, really trying to be inspired by people. The other attribute um, that our value, one, the other value that we really represent is this strong, strong value around prototyping. We believe that it, it's much, much better to prototype early and fail often uh, because that whole process of prototyping is going to teach you something. So we spend an awful lot of time, even at very, very early stages. This is actually a prototype for an automobile client that we had in which we were trying to configure a few elements of a new dashboard. But we designed very, very quickly a prototype just so that we could experience what that might feel like in a dimensional, in a dimensional way. So we believe those two things really anchor. Those things are things that everybody at IDEO believes in. We also have a strong, strong value system around creating stuff and bringing them into the world. Um, we have a long history of, of product development. Uh, we have the original um, design patent around the clamshell design for laptop computing. We did the first mouse for Apple, as well as the first mouse pictured here for uh, the Microsoft Corporation. We've done a lot of work in medical equipment. The, the picture here on the, on the middle left is actually of a transport system for um, kidneys when they're being transplanted from a donor to um, someone who's going to receive a, a, a new kidney. Um, we've done work in retail, we've done work in the developing uh, world, um, and we, we are, basically there's no category of work in which we're not really anxious to try our, our hand at. One of the challenges though, when you are a mature organization like IDEO, when you've been around for 30 plus years, um, is, one, is how do you stay relevant? How do you stay not relevant, not only relevant to the outside world, but how do you stay relevant to the talent and the people who are inside your company um, who want to see their own values, their own beliefs, uh, their own ambitions reflected in the way that the company is developing? Because IDEO is really, really nothing more than a people organization, we have no assets, we have no process that is not shared by many, many other people in the world. Um, we are basically a talent organization. So when it's very, very, it, so when you are, are that, it's very important that you start to think about how you um, continue to refresh your organization and make sure that the values that you have are really reflected um, in the way your company works. This is Tim Brown. He's the CEO of IDEO. He's actually the second CEO we've had in our 30-year history. The first was our founder, David Kelly. 
And Tim Brown looked at this problem and he realized that it wasn't really up to him to develop the future of IDEO. There were about 575 designers at IDEO, designers and engineers, I should say, at IDEO. And it was really up to them to help shape where IDEO would go next. It was important that that direction was set by, by a shared set of beliefs and values. So Tim went around and talked to a lot of people. And one of the things that he clearly understood about our organization, I think it's what makes him our CEO, is that the deepest held desire, the deepest held desire at IDEO is to have impact on the world through design. Everybody at IDEO wants to have some kind of impact on the world through design. Probably everybody here wants to have impact in the world through design, but this was definitely a shared value system. So he developed a way of thinking about that and expressed it as, this is where our goals are. It was a shared aspiration that he articulated out to the company. He then started to think about how do we allow people and groups within our company to start to express their desires around that ambition? How can we start to build new offerings, uh, new ways of thinking that are consistent with that? And he called that emergence. So our strategy really is to let the best ideas start to emerge from our design community and support them in just the right ways. We actually even created, because we're a geeky uh, design company, we actually also created a diagram that actually explained to the company what we mean by emergence and how it can work. If you start over here at projects on the left-hand side, that's where we start to think about um, the work that we do for our clients, which is really our primary responsibility. But over several projects, um, it's likely that we're going to start to identify some patterns, some things that we thought were interesting about the world, new trends in retail, new trends in, um, in sustainability. These are things that we, we're going to start to pick up on. Over time, those are going to start turning into conversations. We're going to start to support those by developing points of view. Maybe a community is going to start to form around those over lunch once a week to start to talk about that as an issue. Over time, that community is going to start to form into a crowd. Or it won't. If it doesn't, that's fine. If it does form into a crowd, then we know uh, not only is it an interesting idea, but there's actually people who want to do it. And that's the most important thing for success. So then moving on from a crowd, the, over time, that might actually become a new offering for IDEO, something that we might actually start to express into the world as a, as, as a uh, direction that we want to take. Just a couple examples. We've been doing a lot of work in the social impact uh, uh, world for the last five or six years. Um, one of the projects that we did was with um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, in Seattle, Washington. And they asked us to help with the people that they give uh, their grants to and to provide a tool for them to behave a little bit more like design thinkers when they go off into the field to do research um, in East Africa. Or, this was primarily in East Africa. So we developed what we call the Human Centered Design Toolkit specifically for issues of um, economic development in the third world. And this was a um, a project that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation asked us to make open source. So this document and all of the tools associated with it are available for free on the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation website as well as the IDEO.com website. One of the issues around emergence was that this became such a strong passion area for so many people at IDEO that we've decided to create our own nonprofit to support this kind of work. It's called IDEO.org and it started in September. A another um, example of some work that kind of emerged from our design community is called Open IDEO. And this is a tool for addressing problems specifically around environmental issues and some social impact issues that are large and systemic. And it's a crowdsourcing tool for generating new ideas. The idea here is that um, these kinds of problems you can't solve in a 16-week project and you can't probably solve with a small set of designers. You need many, many people to be addressing these questions. 
So we developed this crowdsourcing tool. And the main uh, innovation or the main feature that makes it feel like an IDEO ex uh, experience for us is that whenever the proce our process goes divergent and we're looking for more and more and more, whether they're insights or concepts, um, we open that up to the world. We have 17,000 individual users right now on, on um, IDEO.org. But whenever the process requires some judgment or narrowing down or setting up some priorities, we take that inside and we work with a team of designers to start to set those priorities. Once we've done that, then we take that out back out for the next step in the process and we go divergent with a larger group of, of, um, with, in the world. We have a lot of tools for collaborating. This is actually called um, the collaboration map. And this is a tool to help you um, see real time what ideas are emerging, what our ideas are arising, um, and what ideas might be falling into, into the background. So you can click on any of these uh, boxes and also see not just the idea or a little bit more information, you also can understand what kind of insights um, or observations um, supported that idea in the development. The last example of emergence at IDEO I thought I'd share is just the way where we're working these days. These are the traditional offices at IDEO. We're very European and North American centric. Um, but over the last few years, we've um, developed a lot of, um, of interest and a lot of focus on some emerging economies, particularly India and Singapore um, and in Shanghai. And one of the reasons we're focused on those areas is not just because they're the most interesting places. We, we love Brazil, we've been working in Brazil, and we'd love to open here. But we actually have, for these offices, we actually had some critical mass of leadership and people who were um, moving that uh, forward as a, as, a, as a desirable thing to create a new office there. In Singapore, for example, uh, design thinking is uh, being championed by the Singaporean government. They're the main driver for in bringing design thinking into the culture at Singapore. So we're working very closely with the Singapore government and a number of their ministries. In Mumbai, we're focused um, both on uh, large enterprises in the Indian economy, as well as some of the social impact projects that, that um, we'd like to um, see change um, and improve the uh, conditions in India. The next example uh, I wanted to share with you is Burning Man. And Burning Man um, is this really interesting um, event that takes place one week every September in the middle of the desert of, of Nevada. Um, I think it's the first week of September every year. And it's this event that brings together 50,000 people uh, for just this one week. And it's intended uh, to be this extremely creative and collaborative kind of outburst of creativity in the middle of the desert. W one of the reasons I wanted to share this with you as an example is um, at IDEO we frequently, when we're doing uh, research, we often look for extreme uh, user studies. We look for people who are exaggerated examples of any particular kind of uh, behavior uh, that we want to look at. Burning Man seems to me to be an example of an extremely creative community, extremely collaborative community that happens almost like a flash mob in the middle of the desert. This is an, a photograph, an aerial photograph of what they call the playa, which is where everybody um, uh, takes up residence over the course of the, of the there are 50,000 people represented there. And it's, a, it's an amazing event. It got started in the California, on a California beach about 15 years ago, I believe. Um, and there were a few hundred people who came together and had a kind of a festival and ended up burning the effigy of a big statue of a man. And that became the symbol for this event, um, but eventually was transferred uh, for scale reasons, among others, uh, into the desert in Nevada. So I am unfortunately, hopelessly, way, way too square to ever go to Burning Man. <laughs> I think you could tell that. But... What makes me fascinated by this event is that when we talk to burners, and that's what people who go to Burning Man every year call themselves, they're burners. When you talk to burners, this is transformative. This changes their life. They organize their entire year around this event. People I work with 
are already in construction phase of some of their projects that they want to take with them out to the desert next September. They are already starting to build and to think about what kind of impact they want to have. This is the most important part of their year. I have met, I know about five people who met their spouses at Burning Man. It's an amazing, amazing event. So I think there's something to learn here. Um, I don't know if I'm ever going to experience it myself, but I think it's a pretty interesting moment. So we, we, when we talk to, to the burners at IDO, and there are a considerable number of them, a couple of themes started to percolate, percolate up that we thought were really interesting. One was this whole idea of diversity, scale, and what we call mashups. So um, the diversity and the scale part, that's kind of obvious. With 50,000 people, you probably have to have something pretty amazing about to happen. But what's interesting to me is that it's actually the scale itself that actually delivers some of the value. The bigger this event is, the more people contributing and being part of this, the better the experience is. So actually the scale is not a problem, it's a virtue. One of the things that scale brings you um, is that it actually allows you to have really, really interesting creative mashups. You might have these things that never ever planned to be shown together or to be nearby or to inspire each other or to have any connection to each other suddenly start to play off of each other and create something new just in that interaction. And that's a really, really interesting lesson when you think about your own creative communities. How can you create those things that are kind of unanticipated but things that you can start to mash together and really inspire a different point of view? In this case, what, what uh, Burning Man often does is they, they create a, a theme for the year. And this year, the theme, I believe, was the sea. And one of the installations that people spent months and months and months and a lot of money to transport out into the desert was that they built in the middle of the desert an ocean pier as, an, as a place where you could just stroll and walk and meet with other people. Now, the other thing that happens at um, Burning Man is that there are no automobiles or buses or, or cars or, or trucks allowed on the playa. They are all eliminated. Except if you have an art car or a mutant car. If it's cool enough, you are more than welcome to bring it onto the playa. And those have to be inspired by the same themes. But what happens were, when we observed was all of the mutant cars and all of the vehicles that had a nautical theme just like the pier they started to swim around the pier in this creative way that nobody really had anticipated. It was just kind of a, a fluke. It was a funny thing that happened. But it was one of those things that made the event very, very memorable. Another thing that we, we learned at, um, by talking to Burners was that one of the under, underpinnings for the event is the spirit of abundance and sharing. This opportunity uh, to really, really um, almost play a part as a host in this large, large 50,000 person uh, gathering. So one of the tenets is that at, at Burning Man is that you have to bring everything that you will need for the week with you. And you have to take everything you use out when you leave. There will be no stores, nothing is for sale, there's no merchandising, it is absolutely forbidden and taboo to do anything like that. But one of the things we learned out is that the art installations turned into opportunities for sharing and gifting with other people. So a lot of the installations that were really art installations were actually little restaurants or bars or cocktail areas that people would set up so that they would become part, of kind of a station in the whole process, the whole event at Burning Man. This was Vegianopolis, which was a place for all the vegetarians um, at Burning Man to get a meal um, if they wanted to uh, share that. The last, um, theme that seemed to really be interesting when we think about creative herds um, was this idea of spotlighting and recognition. So there's no, there's no program, there's no MC, there's no way in which people will direct your attention one place or another. It's a free-for-all event that takes place on a vast, vast uh, plain in the desert. But there are certain landmarks that people start to expect. These very large, the Burning Man effigy for one, 
This is an installation that was created by one of the founders, I believe, um, of Burning Man, one of the people who originally was part of the organization. And every year, he creates a very, very personal expression, something that he wants uh, to share with people. That behavior became a way of modeling out the best behaviors of being a burner. And it became a way for other people to understand the behaviors that they should, they should use. Um, and also, it's an interesting way to start to understand what the values of the community were. So people started to gather around parts of the playa that had particular installations because they were more popular or more interesting. So you got a sense of the things that were being valued and recognized and spotlighted kind of in a very organic, bottom-up way. And we think it's really important when you're thinking about a creative community to keep your ears tuned to that kind of, kind of bottom-up recognition. What is everybody at the, at, at the peer level feeling about something? So one of the things that I thought was interesting is you usually think of structure and chaos as being kind of a opposites, things that you have to kind of hold apart or, or, or one has to be bigger than the other. And at Burning Man, it really was the interesting thing was structure and chaos were kind of had a symbiotic relationship. They were actually the same thing. And the important thing about Burning Man was that there was just enough structure to allow everybody to participate in exactly the way they wanted to participate. It was never too much structure and it was never too little. It was just enough. When we thought about that, we also heard that um, Burning Man has actually a set of rules. They have a set of principles that they expect people to live by and they have these principles posted when you come onto the playa so that you remember them throughout the day. Some of them are, um, they're listed here. There's 10, they're very simple. Things like radical inclusion, everybody's, inv everybody's invited, everybody can participate. Decommodification, if you wear any kind of logo on a shirt, people will come and put tape over the logo. There's no commodification allowed. Um, leave no trace. This is something that is very, very important to burners. You have to take everything you use with you out of the, the desert. It has to be left untouched. Um, and this lo a lovely idea of radical self-expression, which I think the video kind of um, it was a good example of some of the amazing kinds of ways in which people really, really use this opportunity to showcase their talents and their, what they want to express in the world. The last example I wanted to share with you is a startup company in Europe called Hack Forward. Um, and it was started by this man named Lars Henriks, who came to IDEO probably about two years ago with a very strong goal and a, a, a idea that he had. So Lars Henriks is a very young German entrepreneur who started a company called Zing.com. And it's, I, I understand it is uh, the German equivalent of LinkedIn. It's about professional networking. And it's uh, very, very, uh, has many, many users um, within uh, Germany and I think within the EU. So Lars Henriks had a lot of money and he had a lot of ambition for changing um, uh, the world. So after he made all this money and went on vacation, he came back with this idea that what if he could do for Europe what Silicon Valley had done for the United States technology and for the United States uh, world of entrepreneurship? How could he transform Europe into a much, much more entrepreneurially focused economy? So uh, Lars had also had a theory he thought that there was lots and lots and lots of talent, lots of technology talent. Geeks, he would call them, everywhere in Europe. But those geeks tended to be inside corporations. And those large corporations didn't really support the kind of entrepreneurial behavior that he thought would really transform the European economy. So a lot of these geeks worked their day job, and in the evenings, they worked up in their room, if they still lived at home with their parents, or they um, worked in their garage around building out uh, some ideas that they had. But they were always balancing these two things and they, they frankly didn't have the skills to think about building out their own company. And they had no support, no encouragement. Um, and so Lars came to us and to ask us, how can we support uh, these uh, geeks in a much, much better way? What makes this different from a traditional venture capital fund is that he wanted to support not just the ideas, 
that these people had not just the, 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 the companies, but he wanted to support the people themselves and to help them become more entrepreneurial. He was trying to build a new entrepreneurial class of people for Europe. So we spent a lot of time talking with uh, these geeks and finding out what makes them tick and what, what they might need. Um, and the solution uh, was a company called Hack Forward. And I'm going to share with you a video um, that's on their website as a way to explain what, their, what the value proposition for Hack Forward is. Hello. If you're like us, you love building cool stuff, pushing what's possible, breaking new ground, imagining the future. Maybe you work a day job in Paris, but spend your nights coding a pet project. Maybe you're finishing up a PhD in London, but think your final dissertation might have legs beyond the classroom. Or maybe you've already started a little venture in Istanbul, but feel ready to take it to the next level. We'd like to invite you to Hack Forward, where Europe's most passionate developers turn their great ideas into game-changing tech startups with global impact. Why are we doing this? Well, we're all successful tech entrepreneurs ourselves, and we're building exactly the support and advice we wish we'd had back when we first started. So how do we work? You come to us through our referrer network with a clickable idea, and perhaps even the co-founder or two who helped you build it. Forget PowerPoint and pie charts. We'd rather understand why you believe the world needs it. If we agree your product shows potential, even if there's plenty yet to resolve, we'll roughly match your current salary for one year, so you can spend that time focused entirely on making it something great. And it doesn't matter where you're based in Europe, at most you're two hours away by plane or seconds away by email. We'll make it easy for you to connect with our network of experienced tech entrepreneurs who can give input at any point along your journey as you grow and learn to manage a business. We also handle the administrative load, like salary payments, contracts and accounting, or even finding talent when you're ready to scale up. And once you've launched, we'll throw our full weight behind promoting your product as widely as possible. In exchange for money, creative and strategic advice, and administrative help, Hack Forward gets 30% equity in your startup. You keep 70%. No small print, no surprises. If you succeed, we succeed. And we intend to do everything we can to ensure you do. We also believe in rewarding those who help you most along the way. That's why we'll give you back 3% of our share of the equity so you can use it to say thank you to whomever made the biggest impact. It could be the person who referred you in the first place, or an advisor with particularly smart advice, or even another Hack Forward startup who gave a crucial bit of feedback. Great input is great input, and you'll receive plenty of it along the way. Which also means that if you help others, you stand to get gifted equity in their startups too and learn from what they're doing in real time. Even if your startup doesn't take off, and there will always be some that won't, a year with Hack Forward will be one of unparalleled professional learning and growth. So, what do we stand for? Put simply, Hack Forward is about momentum, about freedom to focus on your passion, and the inspiration and input you need to make the best choices along the way. So you can get to beta sooner. Integrate feedback better, learn faster, and dream bigger. Because we love imagining the future too, and we'd like to help you build yours. Welcome to Hack Forward. <laughs> so actually, we're very proud of, of that video, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, so. A couple of things I wanted to highlight from that video is, so Lars's vision was how, does, how do we create this new class of people that is under-supported um, in Europe today? So his, his primary uh, innovation, the one that we helped him develop, was first of all uh, to take away all of the issues that uh, people who are afraid of starting a startup uh, might have. So all of the things that you don't know about, like how do I set up a company? How do I hire the first people? What kinds of skills do I need? Do I need an accountant? Do I need a lawyer? All of those things start to go away a little bit so that we take a little bit of that load off. 
The second thing was providing one-year salary match to the current salary that that person is, is getting inside a corporation. So a person has the freedom to leave that job and focus on the only thing in the world that matters to them, their idea, and to support that as much as they can. One of the other, I think, I think interesting um, initiatives here was this whole idea of gifting and creating a, a kind of value system around sharing and providing feedback and useful advice. We thought it was important in, in Burning Man. We think it's doubly important here to think about how do you become a generous culture around your advice and what are the right incentives pr for providing that. In addition to this 3% back of the stock, there's also a gifting currency that people get and they can share that with each other. Um, they have a particular value, but it's a way for people to exchange um, uh, information on a much, much more real-time basis. So, in addition to that video, um, IDEO created a whole lot of their online presence. We created very simple tools here on the left to think about what this might mean to your, to your, um, to your budget. How do you start to understand who owns what share and how much you have left at the end of the, the transaction? In the middle here, that's a little hard to see, we have um, um, much, much simpler diagrams to explain what the process will be. The middle part is a flow chart that tries to describe what the experience of being a hack forward entrepreneur will be in a language that actually makes sense to computer scientists. And the geek agreement is, a, in fact, the contract that you'll sign. And we did our very best to take out all of the legal language um, that is confusing and to put in only the most essential information, the clearest expression of what people will get from this experience. One of the things that we also learned was that as important as it was to create an extended network of people and of support and advisors in the world, it doesn't really replace the kind of intimate community that new entrepreneurs need as part of that feedback process. So one of the recommendations that we gave Lars was that they need to meet as a community all of the current entrepreneurs as well as Lars, as well as all of the extended support people that are part of the Hack Forward network need to meet once a quarter. So four times a year, they fly to Spain, which isn't too bad. They fly to Spain and meet to have workshops, to have experts come in and talk about things that, frankly, these entrepreneurs don't know anything about, things like marketing and communications. Um, all the things that people will start to need to develop as they start to build their company out. So this is one of those um, human, real-time um, uh, uh, events that, hap that re are really, really important to supporting the Hack Forward community. So to close, I just wanted to share a few thoughts that I had about um, putting these together a little bit and thinking about what you might want to consider as you move forward and start to build out the creative herds that you want to work with. What are the ways in which you as small business owners or uh, people inside um, corporations, how do you want to start thinking about the teams that you develop um, around design? One of the things I think it's really important to think about is being really, really clear and articulate, um, but also discreet around how you design the framing of your team. What is the overall structure and what is the intent, the purpose, um, the set of goals that you have? What's the right amount of structure that will give everybody the right amount of support, but also allow people to fill in the gaps? I think it's really, really important when you're starting to think about an organization or a team is to leave a lot of the problems unsolved and allow people who are joining the group to start to address and solve those problems themselves. So step back and allow teams to really align around some of the passion areas that you really can't even anticipate them having. It's really important to allow those things to develop on their own. And probably really important when you start to think about this is in the overall style and intent of your organization is to make sure that everybody understands that change will be constant. That change is not a bad thing. This is one of the hardest things it is for uh, people in any profession to deal with. Change is one of the most frightening aspects of our life. But in creative organizations, 
it should be something that we learn to tolerate or even embrace as much as possible. So looking for ways to which that everybody understood that change will always be happening in the organization. As you build out the structure, as you start to build out that framework for what your organization believes in, values, moves forward, you have to make sure that that structure supports the behaviors you want. It's a classic problem for many organizations that they don't get the behaviors from their employees or their teams that they thought they were going to get. Why do people not work in the ways that we want them to work? Well, one of the problems is that we've actually created organizations that encourage them to work in other ways. So make sure that you align structure and behavior in really important ways. Make sure that you, you anticipate and look for mashups and constructive clashes. Don't hire people from the same school, from the same background, from the same country. Think about acting generously and gifting inspiration to one another. How can you actually make the, the act of sharing ideas more important than actually holding on to those ideas? And when, you, when great things start to emerge, look for ways in which that community itself is recognizing um, those emergent ideas and celebrate that. And finally, I think it's really, really important to think about what role speed and momentum will play in your organization. As designers, we really have an opportunity to break all the rules about how organizations work. We should work fast. We should default to, toward fast. So help teams self-organize and eliminate bureaucracy. Organizations, as they get larger, almost always build up unnecessary layers of bureaucracy and rules. Those aren't great places for designers and design to work. Look for ways to always dismantle that if you can. Optimize your team around speed. That means probably smaller teams rather than larger teams, but still teams nonetheless. Think about ways in which you think about um, timelines and schedules. When are you going to start to move to a prototype? When will that be shared with consumers? Think about ways in which your process itself is biased towards speed. And when you don't have those experts resident inside, make sure to build a really, really useful and complete network of advisors and experts beyond your own creative herd so that you can include that kind of inspiration, those kinds of ideas into the work. Bring them in for brainstorms. Look for ways in which your organization has a lot of, of channels out into the world. And that's, those are my comments for tonight. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk tonight.